Good morning. My name is Brad. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my pleasure and honor to share the word with you this morning. Adam sometimes greets me. Uh, he says, hey, be rad. And uh, I like that moniker. I try to live up to it. It's kind of a challenge. Today we're going to be talking about the name of the Lord, and so I, I was looking for something clever to say. So anyway, how is everybody? Are you doing all right? How many of you feel like you're in the fire? Do you feel like you're in the fire? Yeah. Well, it's all okay. It's good. Uh, I was thinking while I was getting ready to come up here, there was a time we were singing this song, and this is what stirred it in me. I was... Uh, I was in this kind of a season of hyper faith, and I may have told you this story before, but uh, uh, anyway, I ended up in a hospital in Pullman, Washington. The hospital whole thing was about the size of this room, and uh, fortunately, I had a good doctor, and I was having a conflict of faith because I had made bold declarations that I'll never let a doctor touch me because Jesus is my healer because I was rash and young, (laughs) and... and, uh, Anyway, the doctor came in and he told me the way that I broke my leg, uh, took a fall on a job, and the way that I broke my leg, he said, you will most definitely be crippled when you're older if you don't let me put a couple of screws in there because I can't bind the bone together and you're going to heal with a bunch of mush in there. And uh, he was a sports doctor, and so he said, if you'll just let me put a couple screws in there. Well, I was having a horrible conflict. Now I'm of faith. And so here I am laying. I just got done eating breakfast about 15 minutes before I had this fall. And so they had to have me lay there in this bed for quite a few hours before they could do surgery on me. And so while I'm laying there, uh, I prayed this prayer. And I said, Lord, I just, I just need to know you're with me. I can go through anything if I know you're with me. And it was amazing, and I won't take the time to tell the whole elaborate story of how the Lord uh, showed me His presence and that He was with me in this thing where my, my faith was being shaken right to the core. Things, something I fiercely believed about the Lord, and it was being shaken and modified. And uh, so, as you mature in the faith, (laughs) which is what all of our trials and things lead to, as you mature, you will find that you'll be less concerned with what the Lord does for you, and you'll be far more concerned with experiencing His closeness day by day. Amen? Had the kids been let go? I think they're gone. They fled the scene of the crime before I even got up here. They knew, they knew I would forget. So, well, let's pray, and then we'll get right into this thing. Father, thank you so much for your presence, that your great desire, Lord, is to be our God and for us to be your people, that you can dwell with us and walk with us and be with us and celebrate with us, and all of the things that we as humans have been given as a gracious gift, Lord, to enjoy this world and this life, and then to dwell and exist in a hope that's even beyond all this. How wonderful you are. I pray, Father, that you will be glorified in the words that we say today, in the meditations and thoughts of our hearts. Speak to us, Lord, individually, personally, with what we need to hear in this simple exhortation that we'll give this morning. We ask it because Jesus rose from the dead and is our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, today we're going to be looking at Exodus 20, verse 7. And this verse sits in a section of Scripture known as the Ten Commandments. And it's commonly understood as the Third Commandment. I'm going to shake your boat a little bit today on that. And uh, not that it's going to matter that much, but it will, you'll see. (laughs) So Adam has done a tremendous job of opening up this, um, these passages of Scripture and uh, very adeptly pointing out that 
they were, we were called from slavery and brought out of slavery and brought to this place where God is now speaking to his people. And I'm going to open that up a little bit a little later on in this sermon. But uh, it was, it's really important that deliverance, deliverance happens first, then instruction. And so anybody, any, anybody in here uh, that has come to the Lord probably came to a point of their decision, they were drawn, and then they started to discover what sonship or daughtership meant as they went along. Because all of a sudden things that didn't bother them start to kind of bother you more. Your conscience awakens to God. And, you know, even if you don't know these commandments, if you will, or these ordinances, something in your heart happens where you began to be sensitive about things. Like, you know, I never had a particular, I mean, I could tell, I'm a storyteller. And I can tell, Darlene will attest to this. I can tell some whopping lies, very convincingly. Not so much after I met Jesus, okay? So anyway, you follow what I'm saying. We're, we're particularly attempting to move beyond the hard line of legally understanding or legal understanding of these codes, if you will. And they're usually presented that way. And we're trying to find grace and wisdom in them. Life-giving and sustaining spirit, if you will, behind the common interpretation. And uh, by God's grace, we will do that again this morning. Uh, most readers and uh, many scholars divide these oracles of the covenant in such a way as to divide verses 3 and 4. And I probably should have put them up here. But it says, I am the Lord that brought you out uh, of Egypt. And then uh, the second uh, part of that phrase is, uh, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an idol for yourself. But if you, if you consider this, that those first two commandments, if you will, are actually a unified thought. It, it, it's kind of, the second one doesn't really stand alone. He says, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. But idol worship uh, involves entertaining another god. So the two come together in a single declaration of who Yahweh is, who our God is. And that's his self-revelatory name, Yahweh. We say it Yahweh. We add some vowels in. With, uh, anyway, I don't want to get off on that. But a very strong argument can be made that these two verses belong together, which would make what we're talking about today actually the second commandment. Does it matter a lot? You know, are you missing the grace of God because... You know, you know, because I said that and you go, yeah, I'm going to buy into that, you know. No, it's not going to affect your understanding of these things. But it does, it does set up, it does help us set up for this next commandment about what, uh, to bring it to a fuller, richer meaning than what we probably hold it as now. Uh, Together, verses 2 through 6 unify a single statement about who Yahweh is. He declares who he is. He is declaring in a definitive way his self-identification and his proper role as such. He's saying, I'm the dad. You're not. That's what he's saying. That's what he's doing. I'm the father. Uh, in this view... Uh, this is the view of many modern interpreters, including Carmen Imes, which I'm going to draw from. I think she's brilliant. She's currently writing a, uh, an exhaustive commentary on Exodus. It won't even be ready until next year for Baker. And uh, she has done, she did her dissertation on this very verse. And so it's rich. And, uh, and I have read and studied some of her stuff, and so I draw from her, but she's one of these that puts it together in this way. In verse 7, though, the attention is turned to who we are, the people of God, and what our role is to be. By interpreting this way, we stay truer and more cohesively within the meta narrative. Now, that's a $9 word. The meta narrative is the single story 
of the Scripture. There's not, contrary to some of you maybe were brought up under replacement theology. Israel failed, God wrote them off, and then there's this new thing, the church. The meta narrative interpretation of Scripture, which is far more cohesive, is a single story, and we've been preaching this for years in here, and this is the way we approach our theology. It's a single story. We have been grafted into Israel. So we're kind of like adopted Jews, if you will, <laughs> you know, but not. But we're the Gentiles, and so the whole of Scripture bears witness with this truth. And so what we have is we have this, this one single story. And how, why is that important? Because we get all of these cultural inputs, if you will, into the interpretation of Scripture. And by understanding this meta narrative, we can rise up above all of those cultural influences and we can find a more stable understanding of this universal truth of Yahweh, the Creator God, who sent His Son to redeem us and make us His people. And we see His whole motive for why He did what He did. And so this is, a, this is very important. And so so that being said, we're prepared to exact out all the grace contained in this simple phrase. Or maybe not so simple. Contained within this verse is the whole of our identity and purpose. The whole of our identity and purpose in this world. We can only stick our toes over the edge of this vast landscape and gaze upon the panoramic vista before us. In the simple words, you shall not take my name in vain. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The depths and the riches of the Almighty if we can have 20, uh, Exodus 20, verse 7, it says, there we go. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Sounds simple enough. You don't misuse his name. You don't say his name the wrong way. We have countless interpretations. How many of you, you know, have, have heard this thing, you know, where someone will, like on a movie or something, and someone will use the name of Jesus in a derogatory way, and you'll go, oh, and the first thing that comes to your mind is this commandment, you know, oh, you shouldn't do that, you know, <gasps> you know, and, you know, and you're always surprised, you know, I've been surprised in restaurants and, and places around when lightning bolts didn't come down and strike people who were just openly blaspheming the name of the Lord, you know, and it, and it hurt my spirit, hurt my heart. You know, and so we have that natural reaction. You can see why we would kind of go to that, that it's a speaking thing. It has something to do with speaking. In my preparation, I discovered that more than 23 various interpretations of this verse have, have had some leverage in church's traditions over the centuries. They have crisscrossed through different cultures, eras of time, different influencers, etc. And some of them you may recognize. Don't cuss like I just was talking about. Don't use the, the Lord's name that way. Don't say God's name. Uh, or have a legalistic insistence upon how to verbalize the divine name. We've all heard stories about how the ancient Jewish people, they wouldn't even say the name because they were afraid they might mispronounce it. So that would be one of those. That would be an, a legalistic insistence, uh, a behavioral thing, if you will. Invoking Jesus' name for personal gain and manipulation. Uh, we see this in politics a lot, I think. People will invoke the name of the Lord or refer to him and stuff. The whole time, you know, they're, they're, they're encased in, you know, a flow of, of lies. All of them. You know, we make jokes about it nowadays, and it's true. Everything you read in the news and everything you hear when you see lips moving, it's probably lying. You know, we're just, our, our country, our culture is saturated in this thanks to, thanks to this. I'm almost thinking this might be the, in Revelation, you know, the, where the devil was given power to speak. I'm thinking it might be that. No, no. I know you guys take what I say serious, so that was a joke. 
That was a joke. No invoking Jesus' name for personal gain. But how often do we do that? Out of greed or manipulation. We want to manipulate the thing. We throw some, you know, half-jack prayer out there, you know, to impress the people in the restaurant, you know, with our big wooden cross hanging on us and whatnot. We're looking for something when we do that sort of stuff. And it's not a bad application of what we're saying. But what I am about to tell you is it, all of that fits in under a, as an umbrella, as an auxiliary, if you will. Out of hubris, to appear as one with divine power or favor. Jesus had a particular uh, irritation with this one. You love to pray in the public places, he said to the scribes and Pharisees. You love to do that, and you love to have the first, invoking the name and, and putting on airs, hubris. All of these are attempts at behavior modification or control. Legalism. As such, there is some level of half-truth to all of them, as we shall see. These all fall short and result in the domestication or the watering down for easier compliance. And this is my personal grind. <sighs> that we have taken the gospel of Jesus Christ and watered it down to where it's palatable to every sinner. <sighs> it makes no demand. Fuzzy Jesus. Yes, he was the lamb. But he's not, he's... <laughs> yes. And I'm all about cotton ball Jesus, believe me. You know me. And I like to be kind, and we should be. And Jesus is kind. But our Father, our God, is forthright. He is a good Father. Me, not so much. You know? I'd let my kids squoosh out, you know? And, you know, and do things they shouldn't, you know, and, I was, and I'd have too soft a hand oftentimes. Not that I'm saying that, we, that God should have a hard hand with us, but you're going to, you know, if I do this well, you're going to see why it's important that we embrace this faithfulness of God. So this watering down of what it means, all of these things that we've said are a watering down of what's being said in this actual verse. It robs, us, it robs us of the life and the blessing that the instruction brings to us. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick story if I got, I got a, a, a little bit of time. When I first became a Christian, I was going to a little Methodist church out here in the valley. Wonderful. I mean, we loved it. The pastor was great. Brother Gary Austin, who I will talk about openly and publicly because I'm going to say a good thing about him. He saw my wife and I struggling. We, they lived in the valley. We did too. And they were not too far from us. Ran into Gary on a job. He invited us out to his house and introduced us to the idea of God's generosity. We didn't know a thing. We were newbies. We didn't know anything. And Gary and Carolyn went on and on about this generous God. And then Gary looks at me and he goes, do you tithe? And I go, what? And he goes, he goes do you tithe? You know, like give a tenth of your income. And I'm like, never heard of it. And, you know, it seemed strange to me. Darlene and I didn't have two nickels to rub together. We were wondering how to get a loaf of bread, you know, by Thursday, you know, day before payday. We, we were in dire straits. We were pretty broke. It was a tough time. Anyway, Gary teaches me about this, and uh, I take it to heart. My heart is burning. As he's told us, they have told us stories and stories about God's blessing, meeting them, as they've been faithful to God. And so... I can remember this as just as, I remember going home and the next Sunday we went, just walked up the street and I walked up the street to the little church where we went to church and I had $18 in my checking account and I did the widow's mite thing. I guess I put the Lord to the test, but I wrote a check for $18 and I put that in the offering. It was my widow's mite. We were so broke, you know, and everything. And uh, anyway, I felt pretty good about it. Nothing really happened, no lightning bolts or anything. But I went out and I was standing in the foyer on the way out and people were greeting and a brother came up and put a check in my shirt pocket and said, you know, the Lord spoke to me about this and he says, I, you know, I was going to give it to you before the service, but so he had it already written out and put a check for 
I'm not going to say for how much, but it was significantly greater amount than what I had offered. It was a little bump by the Lord to help me. I did not know what my future held and how I would be called to stand in faith for finances again and again and again and again. But he knew where he was taking me, and that was the beginning of things. And so the story's not really about tithing, but about faithfulness. And so anyway, the pastor of the church came over doing the stewardship thing, and he started talking to me about maybe pitching a little money in here and there. And I had the what for for him. I said, why don't you teach me about, why didn't you teach me about tithing? I was upset. I was mad because Gary had helped me find this divine flow of blessing. And this pastor was worried about talking about money. You won't get that from me. Anybody that's been hanging around me for a while will figure that out in a hurry, you know. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we can water down things and we miss this incredible life that God has for us by doing so. We need to move on. The Hebrew word for take, don't take the names of the Lord, is nasa. It means to carry, to lift up, or to bear. In Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, it says this, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. This is just prior to him coming to the foot of the mountain and receiving the laws. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth, for all the earth, all the earth, belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. And just one example of many. Notice, carry in that verse, plus special treasure. In 1 Peter 2 through 9, and this goes to the meta narrative. But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. He's talking to the followers of Jesus, you are a chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession, special treasure. To say the Jews are the chosen people, yeah, but that's us. You see how the meta narrative comes into play in this? Peter is bringing it forward. We are a continuation of God's self-revelation in the world and in his purposes. He goes, once you had no identity... Oh, he says, as a result of being the special treasure, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. To take the name is to bear, to carry, to represent him. This is what it means to bear his image as well. Sin marks the image of God in us. And it makes us sorry at our testimony at best. Sin makes you stupid, as Alan would often say. It does. We fall short, as it says in Romans 3. We fall short of the glory of God. This word from Yahweh gives us his name and defines our identity. We are who he says we are. You'll do better taking up what he says about you than what you conjure up in your own weakened mind. He says, you're a special treasure. I am. I remember the first time I was, we were talking about holiness and I said, well, I'm holy. Man, I got a stern rebuke from the several that were around me because they wanted to have, they wanted to hold on to this sin consciousness, but I didn't see it that way. I was seeing that God was with me. He was present with me and that there was something different about me. I started to learn that the things that others could do with impunity, I could no longer do. Why? Because I was his son. I was, I belonged to Yahweh. I was re representing him. I was carrying the family name, if you will. I just knew it by the Holy Spirit. If we confess him as Lord, we better mean it. We'll get to that in a minute. If we turn our attention from here to Jesus, we'll see continuity in the meta narrative. In the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew 6, verses 9, it says this, Pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. These are the first two commandments. 
enriched and condensed. Do you hear it? Our Father is the fullness and the enrichment of I am the Lord your God that brought you out. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain is may your name be kept holy. May your name be remembered and separated. And so anyway. Anyway, we need to jump forward quickly to the second part of the deal about, uh, of the verse, Exodus 20, verse 7, about discipline. There's a tremendous amount of blessing in the promise to judge in this verse. We'll only scratch the surface, but I'm sure it'll be helpful. When the Lord rises to bring discipline or justice to his children, it is to set them right. It is the, this is the basis for understanding him and the enduring term Abba, our Father. When he teaches us, it is for our benefit. We become greater. He will resist our falling short and will turn us to himself for his name's sake so that others can find him and find life. For his name's sake. What does that mean? Here in this short promise, God sets us up for the necessary, sets us up the necessary foundation for respect. We read the promises of the Lord and we find the concept fear of the Lord. That is what it means to respect him. It was like my stepdad, I, I, just, I didn't have him in his proper place and I beat up one of my siblings when I was about 13 and he straightened me out quickly. He grabbed me by the waddles of the neck and lifted me up till I was on my tippy toes. Looked me right in the eye and he said, you're the oldest brother, your job is to take care of these younger ones. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> and when he set me down after that, I had this idea of sir in my heart. Enough said. We're out of time, so I don't want to go much further, but you get the point. We read the promises of the Lord, and we find the concept of the fear of the Lord. Sin is lawlessness and is void of true respect. Sinners do not have godly respect. Sinful respect is based upon fear of retribution or greed. Relationship and intimacy with Yahweh through the Holy Spirit births reverence and deep respect, resulting in the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 2, verses 5 through 11 says, Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord, and you will gain knowledge of God, for the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth came knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair. Then you will find the right way to go, for wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. All because you have a respect for the Lord and his presence in your life. A deep respect He's sitting in the easy chair and his eyelids are testing the sons and daughters of mankind to see what we'll do. He's watching us. He's a watchful father. Proverbs 16, 6 says this, unfailing love and faithfulness make atonement for sin. By fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. If you're sinning with impunity, there's something wrong with your respect level. If your sin is not bothering you and you're hiding it and playing games, something's missing. That's all I'm saying. The word of the Lord. Hopefully this short exhortation on Exodus 20 verse 7 has broadened your view of God's love and fatherhood. The unfathered need laws and the harsh punishment to overcome their folly and to turn them from swift destruction. But children, sons and daughters need intimacy. Vision, purpose, encouragement. Should I read that to you fathers again? This is what your children need. They need intimacy, vision, purpose, and encouragement. They'll find wisdom. It's precisely respect that enables us to be teachable and to experience those things. It changes the desire of our heart. This ordinance that God has given us is the fountainhead of the change of our desire from unrighteousness and sin to righteousness. And that's for his children. 
Other kids down the block can do whatever they want to do, but not us. Not us. Amen? <laughs> we have placed our faith in Jesus. We bear his name. That's no small privilege. We should be very serious about how we represent our Father. Jesus is serious about the Father's name. What does it say in, in John 17? Father, I have glorified your name. Therefore, now glorify my name with the glory that I had with you. See? Jesus honored the Father perfectly. And now his spirit is transforming us to do the same. And we can do this. Jesus said, nothing is impossible to him who believes. All things are possible. He exhorts us to be perfect. Are we there today? No. Will we be there tomorrow? We'll be closer. Amen? I'm done. God bless you. Let's have a baptism.